Welcome to part four of this seven part mini series on how to write an effective diet plan. In today's lesson, what we're going to cover is nutrient timing. So nutrient timing refers to specifically how you spread out the various macronutrients throughout the day. So the purpose behind nutrient timing is in essence to improve nutrient partitioning so more of the nutrients we take in are directed towards our muscle cells and away from our fat cells. Now to better understand nutrient timing, let's look at the concept of net protein balance. Okay. Now net protein balance refers to the difference between muscle protein synthesis and the difference between muscle protein breakdown. If muscle protein synthesis over the course of a given day exceeds muscle protein breakdown, you're going to be in an anabolic state. However, if muscle protein breakdown exceeds muscle protein synthesis, we're going to be in a catabolic state, okay, specifically in relation to the muscle tissue. So how we spread out the nutrients throughout the day is going to have an impact on how that affects the net protein balance. Now, muscle protein synthesis is specifically stimulated when we ingest amino acids. So amino acids are derived from protein, so specifically the essential amino acids, when we ingest them, we trigger an increase in muscle protein synthesis. So because of that, protein is anabolic in that it triggers muscle protein synthesis. Carbohydrates and fats do not cause an increase in muscle protein synthesis. So when we uh, consume carbohydrates, when we consume fats, we don't increase muscle protein synthesis. So carbs and fats are not anabolic. Only protein is the only anabolic macronutrient. Carbohydrates and fats reduce muscle protein breakdown. So they're said to be anti-catabolic. Now, protein <coughs> also reduces muscle protein breakdown. In fact, some studies show when you're in a calorie deficit, a higher protein intake for a given deficit is actually more effective at mitigating muscle protein breakdown. So if we're concerned about uh, increasing net protein balance throughout the course of the day, we need to be concerned with how we can maximize muscle protein synthesis and as much as possible mitigate muscle protein breakdown. Now, we already said ingesting protein increases muscle protein synthesis. Fast-acting proteins like whey protein, isolate, branched-chain aminos, uh, for example, will cause a rapid rise in muscle protein synthesis, but then also a rapid drop. Slower acting protein will cause a more attenuated but more prolonged increase in muscle protein synthesis. So over the course of about a three hour period, slower or mixed protein sources are actually more anabolic than faster acting sources. Okay, Because with the fast acting sources, within an hour, protein um, synthesis or net protein balance is already back to baseline. So for the most part, you want to focus on consuming mixed protein sources wherever possible, so in the form of solid meals, or even just adding carbohydrate or fat to a protein source has been shown to slow down the release and actually can um, increase the thing, net protein balance. So that's something important to note there. Now, when we trigger an increase in muscle protein synthesis, that response will persist for about three hours, which means the anabolic effects of a meal persist for about three hours in total. Now, once we stimulate muscle protein synthesis, we can't stimulate it again. That response will become refractory for about the next three hour period. So we can pretty much um, speculate that the most effective strategy, if maximal uh, growth or trying to stimulate um, maximally protein synthesis throughout the day, is to consume enough protein to maximally trigger muscle protein synthesis, which occurs between uh, 0 0.25 to about 0 0.4 grams per kilo. So generally, the older people need higher amount of protein because they tend to be more resistant um, to muscle protein synthesis. But once you've had enough protein to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis, that anabolic response will persist for about the next three hours. So there's no really need to have protein any sooner than that. On the other hand, if you start leaving longer than three hours, protein synthesis will drop back down. Okay, so if you want to maximally stimulate uh, protein synthesis throughout the day, probably eating roughly at three hour intervals will be ideal. Okay, For fat loss, um, it's not as critical. If your goal is mainly fat loss and just to maintain muscle, we know that anti-catabolic effect of a meal can persist up to five, six hours. And we know meal frequency has no <coughs> impact on metabolism, so to speak, because the thermic effect of feeding is purely dependent on how many calories we consume for the day, not over how many meals we spread those calories. But generally, for muscle growth, we want to aim to get protein roughly every three hours. Okay, so some people, because obviously 
um, you know, that may interfere with their schedule trying to eat every three hours or so, may stick to having their three normal meals for the day and then having three shakes in between meals. So that's a strategy I use with a lot of my clients, which makes it easier to get enough protein throughout the day at regular enough intervals. Now, let's look at carbohydrate and fat. Like we said, carbohydrate and fat, they're not anabolic, but they are anti-catabolic. In other words, by mitigating muscle protein breakdown, we can also increase net protein balance. In other words, we can retain more protein, so create a more um, anabolic state throughout the course of the day. Now, as far as carbohydrate timing, um, depend, this is very, very individualized. So if you look at, um, for example, literature on timing carbohydrates throughout the day, to date, there's about nine studies that I've seen on the topic, and about four of those studies show benefit to having more carbs early in the day, so we call that carb front loading. About three studies show a benefit to having more carbs later in the day, so we call that carb back loading. And then two studies showed no difference, okay? So what does that tell you? Well, it's a very individualized response. As a rule of thumb, if you feel better having more carbs early in the day, have more carbs early in the day. If you feel better having more carbs later in the day, like I do for instance, have more of your carbs than later in the day, okay? Because for me personally, carbs helps calm me down because they actually um, lower cortisol, increase serotonin, so it helps me recover better, it helps me relax at night, helps me sleep better. So I personally prefer having more of my carbs later in the day. Now, depending um, as well with carbohydrates around training, it depends a lot on the person and the type of workout they're doing. So for some people, we know having a lot of carbs pre-workout, so this is usually people that have more insulin resistance, can cause hypoglycemia. So blood sugars will rise and then they'll crash. So they can end up having a poor workout by having a lot of carbs before the workout. So those people may do better having less carbs pre-training and then more of their carbs after training. For people that tolerate carbohydrates well, especially people that are ectomorphs, people that are more prone to going into a catabolic state, especially if they're doing a high volume workout, then it may be beneficial to time more of their carbohydrates around the training. So having some carbohydrates pre-training, which basically creates an anti-catabolic response, and then having, again, carbohydrates even during and then immediately post-training, okay? Now, having carbs immediately post-training is uh, more important, especially if you're gonna train later that day, because it helps rapidly replenish glycogen levels. If you're not training immediately or again that day within a couple of hours, it's not vital to have the carbohydrates immediately after training, but with a lot of people, because uh, as I mentioned previously, carbohydrates help slower cortisol, increase serotonin, it can help with recovery post-training. So I do like to have more of the carbohydrates uh, with most people post-training, and then depending on the person, like I said, if they're ectomorph, I like to give them more carbs pre-training, um, if they're more of an endomorph, someone who's more insulin resistant, then I give them less carbs pre-training, so more fat, because fat burns slower, so they'll have more stable blood sugars, and then I give them more of the carbs post-training, because training sensitizes the muscle cells to insulin, okay? Um, training increases glucose transporters in the muscles, so it helps more the carbohydrates than be shuttled into the muscles, okay? But that response can last hours after training bout, so it's not necessary to have to get the carbs immediately after training, but if it helps you with your recovery, then again, that's something I recommend doing. So let's have a quick recap. So net protein balance is a difference between muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. Ingesting protein or amino acids from protein increases muscle protein synthesis, okay? We wanna generally aim to consume about 0.25 to 0.4 grams of protein per kilo per meal roughly at three hour intervals in order to maximize muscle protein synthesis throughout the day. Now, muscle protein breakdown is mitigated by protein, carbohydrate, and fat, okay? So just consuming enough of the other macronutrients, and specifically, like I said, if you're ectomorph body type, consuming more of the carbs around training because you stimulate insulin, insulin's an anti-catabolic hormone, it stops you from breaking down muscle tissue. Okay, and it keeps the body more anti-catabolic. And then in that turn, it helps increase net protein balance throughout the day. So I hope that was useful to you. In a nutshell, that covers nutrient timing. And I will see you for tomorrow's lesson when we cover the micronutrients. Thank you.